Let's pray. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we pause to thank you for the grace that is given us that is sufficient for every need we encounter. We thank you for your word, for the wisdom that you promise us that we might be able to understand how to apply it to our lives. And we pray for that this evening as we examine your word together and we continue to look at why we do the things we do and how we can overcome that with the provision that you have made for us in your word. Help us make it a lamp to our feet. May we rely upon it as the authority for our life and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have been looking at the old sin nature, the natural disposition of man to sin, and why we do what we do, why we behave the way we behave, and we behave the way we do because that's the way our mind or minds are programmed. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We have identified the word heart does not refer to the blood pump in the center of our chest, but rather it identifies our norms and standards, our mind, where our norms and standards and behavior is directed. Uh, the ancients understood that the, blood, the mind did not function without the heart pumping blood through it, and so if they wanted to emphasize the functioning mind, they referred to the heart. We've kind of distorted that a little bit in our day and time, but when we see heart in the New Testament, well, in the Old Testament as well, it's identifying that aspect of our mind where our norms and standards, our frame of reference, uh, our conscience, uh, whatever it is that dictates our behavior is located. And so we've been talking about renovating that. One of the passages of scripture that we have used uh, is in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, uh, verses 4 and 5. I want to reread those this evening just in a quick review. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, we identified that we are indeed involved in a spiritual warfare. And in order to have a successful Christian life, we have to use the proper weapons in the war in which we are involved. Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Uh, that is, they're not fleshly, and the actual Greek word means fleshly, but they're mighty through God. And that word mighty, uh, dunata, from which we get the word dynamite, uh, means a natural inherent power. So while we refer to our behavior as doing what's natural, for the believer, that's not true because we have been given a new natural inherent power that we might have authority over the old nature and that we truly might be able to experience a victorious living. So the weapons that God gives us are mighty. That is, they have natural inherent power through God to the pulling down or tearing down of strongholds. We left off in our study last time when we had made reference to the strongholds. We identified a number of strongholds that are commonplace with man uh, with some popular uh, names or identifications to them. But a stronghold is wherever it is that we go to find refuge, uh, to seek peace, uh, to get rid of the drip by drip uh, pressure that we experience in our life. I have discovered in my own life, and I'm sure as I've observed others and done quite a bit of counseling that it's common with man, that there is a resilience on our part when we have some kind of catastrophic experience, uh, human beings seem to bounce back from them pretty well. But there is a problem that we recognize that has 
a, an adverse effect on us and really takes its toll. And that's not from some kind of tr catastrophic uh, tragedy of some sort that we bounce back from, but it's the day in and the day out. If it can go wrong, it will. What I call the drip by drip pressure that the Bible refers to living with a contentious woman is worse than a constant dripping. And that phrase refers to uh, a form of oriental torture whereby the victim is immobilized and a drop of water is dripped upon the forehead or upon the exposed chest, one drip after another drip after another drip after another drip. There's nothing painful at all about having a drop of water drip on your forehead or your exposed chest unless it continues on and on and on. And that kind of torture has been known to drive individuals insane. Well, that's what we're really dealing with in the world today. Uh, as I say, we bounce back pretty quick uh, from the catastrophic things that occur to us. But it's the day in and day out. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Murphy's Law says if it can go wrong, it will. And Welch's Law says it could and it did. And constantly in and out and in and out, that drives us to seek some refuge. And too oftentimes, uh, that refuge that we go to is a bottle or a needle or a bottle of pills or uh, some kind of a retreat uh, to try to stop the dripping. Well, we have our various strongholds that we have developed, and we've developed those strongholds uh, based primarily on human logic and human reasoning. And the Apostle Paul says what we need to do is tear them down. And he uses that phrase uh, that relates to renovation. Now, I don't know what your fortress is, where you go to find protection or, or release from the constant dripping or the pressures uh, uh, that you face in life. But last week, we reviewed uh, just a few of the familiar forts uh, or strongholds that we might go to. We identified Fort Hermit. You remember, we identified this as where a lot of people go to find refuge and safety. The word hermit identifies they withdraw into a shell of privacy. Uh, they, they try to shut the drip, drip, drip of circumstances out by avoiding people, and they attempt to isolate themselves. And you can find some temporary solace at Fort Hermit, but there's no way to serve God if you're going to be a hermit and off into some uh, stronghold uh, that you are simply hiding out and isolating yourself. Ours is a ministry with people, and we are to be involved with people. So Fort Hermit is a human uh, contrivance, but not the place that God has designed for us to take refuge. We also meant, uh, mentioned Fort Retaliation. Uh, this brings a little more satisfaction than isolation to some of us. It's where the individual takes the offense uh, and the position, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. They don't get angry, they get even. And like I say, there may be some temporary satisfaction uh, there at Fort Retaliation uh, but uh, from a human aspect, but there's no long-term satisfaction uh, we'll not really find any lasting peace or joy there, nor will we be able to serve God from that position because God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And so we're in contradiction to him if we hide out in Fort Retaliation. We mentioned also Fort Self-Justification. We said that Fort Self-Justification is where a lot of people take refuge they attempt to justify every action and every deed. They never 
uh, are content to let false accusations and criticisms fall into the hands of God. They have to justify themselves. Well, if I believed in luck, I'd say good luck in that adventure. Ours, of course, is not a God of chance, but a God of cause and effect. So you will never be able to find the peace from the drip, drip, drip of circumstances behind the wall of self-justification. And in your attempts to persuade, uh, you will only succeed in developing further frustration. Well, we mentioned also Fort Expectations. Fort Expectations, I said, is a mirage. It's not reality. In a mirage, uh, uh, what appears to be there is not there. And so there are no walls, there are no towers to this fort. And when we foolishly move into fort expectations, where we maintain a standard of expectations of others, uh, of them pulling their weight, of them carrying their load, uh, we're going to be killed by our own despair in that situation. There's no, there's a way that seemeth right unto man, the scripture says, but the ends thereof are destruction and death. And we find that in Fort Expectation, the Mirage. We mentioned also Fort Nike. We said the original motto at Fort Nike was, if it feels good, do it. But their new motto, they eliminated the, the if it feels good, they just simply adopted the motto of just do it. You see, there was a time when folks pursued that which felt good, a, a true manifestation of human logic and reasoning. But now folks just say, just do it. You see, everybody's doing it. And if you want to be accepted, if you want to succeed, then you must do it too. Now to some of us, that's illogical. But the mind that is numbed it is logical, and some believers take refuge there so as not to stand out as being a nonconformist. After all, that's reasonable, isn't it? Well, we also mentioned Fort Deserving. A lot of people take refuge in Fort Deserving. Now, they reason they deserve to get all the gusto they can get. For them, it's a dog-eat-dog, cat-eat-cat world, and they excuse behavior on the basis of their perception and they, that they deserve to have what everyone else has. And from there, well, the means always justifies the end with that kind of logic. Those are just a few of the forts that I have observed people running to to get away from the drip, drip, drip of circumstances. And uh, all of those are not substantial. Those are the strongholds that the Apostle Paul said, we need to tear them down. Now they're imaginary, they're built in our mind and they're built on human logic and reasoning. So we can tear them down plank by plank and board by board if we deal with the logic that is found in the Word of God versus the human logic that we seem to embrace so quickly uh, in the world today. Now, in verse 5 of our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we have uh, an addition to tearing down the strongholds. It says, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, it's what we think. It's our thought pattern and what we have accepted as logical or illogical that is going to determine our frame of reference and build the place of refuge uh, that we are going to look for when we have that drip by drip, drip, drip of circumstances. The Greek text clarifies this verse a little better than the English translation. It says, every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Well, the Greek text says, every high thing rising up against the knowledge that is emanating from God. You see, the real issue 
in those forts that we have identified, those strongholds, is that they are built on human logic and reasoning, and they are in opposition to grace. And they're in opposition to God's word. Look at the text a little closer. Uh, everything, the high thing rising up against the knowledge emanating from God, it begins by exalting, that is, that elevates itself. And the word knowledge here is, is noseos. It's the Greek word that identifies the process of taking in knowledge. It's not knowledge that you have finalized, but the process of taking in knowledge. Every time that we as individual believers uh, uh, become angry or frustrated or worrisome or fearful or anxious or vengeful, we are in rebellion against the Word of God. And the Word of God identifies anger and frustration and worrisome and fearful, uh, anxious and vengeful. It identifies those things as sin. Each time we sin, it's a result of our rising up in rebellion against the knowledge that is emanating from the source of God. You've either not taken the word of God in, or you have rebellious contempt for what God says concerning your situation. So we have to tear down all human logic and reasoning that rises up in rebellion against the knowledge that we find in the Word of God. And when we refuse to tear down our own logic and reasoning, it's a contradiction or rebellion to God, then we are going to continue to remain victims of faulty reasoning and have no kind of protection about us. So we have to tear down the old human logic and reasoning and stop rebelling against the knowledge that we're finding from the Word of God in order to accomplish the objective that is stated in the following phrase, it says, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And that's where it rests, you see. We have to bring into captivity every thought so that we are obedient to Christ. Every one of our thoughts must be brought into conformity then with the knowledge that we find from God in order for us to become obedient to God. And it's our obedience to God that's going to provide for us the protection, the peace, and the joy that we're looking for in all the wrong places. We have to look at sin the way God looks at sin. Man says, no, sin's not good, but it's normal for man. Human logic and reasoning attempt to justify and to excuse our behavior. Even believers justify sin by pointing to the nature of man and his environment. Uh, I have an old nature, we say, and that's the reason I sin. We neglect to add the second chapter that God has given us the means whereby we are no longer under the authority of the old nature and we can have victory over the old nature. We are to be in authority over that nature. And even fundamental Christians like to take the cop out. Well, I've always got 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sin, my fellowship is restored. And we simply need to endeavor to be more like Christ. Well, that kind of thinking is developed from human logic. And uh, with that human logic aspect, uh, we will find ourselves uh, in need of protection, and that drip, drip, drip of circumstances is going to continue. So tearing down the strongholds is not enough. We've got to build another fort. And we just introduced this last time, and we'll pick up there then in looking at what I would like to define as Fort Grace, the stronghold of grace. It's the place where the believer can find safety and contentment. Uh, you'll get your RMA. I don't know if you've earned your RMA degree yet. That means relaxed mental attitude. 
And when you become a member, a resident of Fort Grace, you can also enroll in the program and get your RMA, get your relaxed mental attitude. As we look at this fort, we notice it has walls and towers and will protect us from anything that might threaten our solitude and our joy. Yet, you can still have the freedom to live out your design ministry of service for God. It is not only a protecting stronghold and fort, but it is also a base of operation for you and for me as born-again children of God. Now, in the outline that I gave you last time, we, we stopped just before we got to Fort Grace. Uh, we, we got to this point, and I made the statement that it's the place where you can find safety and contentment. We didn't explore the structure of the fort, and uh, so we'll pick up with that's on the old study that you had last week, but the material for tonight picks up at that point and reviews it. We ran out of time last week, and I didn't get opportunity to simply introduce it. So we're going to, uh, to shift gears and, and move over to the other outline now. Fort Grace, a believer's base of operation. And I comment in the introduction that we've seen in the scripture that we have to tear down the old strongholds, which are built on human logic and reasoning, so that we have a place to build Fort Grace. Now, the analogy identifies these forts as the place that we go for safety and peace, but they also operate as a base of operation. Now, over the course of our lives, we have developed then these strongholds uh, to which we retreat. And I don't know if you've given much thought to our touching on them last week and identifying uh, which fort you take refuge in, or uh, it may not be one just like this, uh, but these are representative of the various ways that we develop uh, human logic and reasoning that results in our being frustrated uh, when they do not support us. The renovation process is first. We have to identify those forts, those strongholds, as what they are according to the word of God and must be committed to tearing them down. And uh, uh, as we, we replace that human viewpoint with divine viewpoint, we will find a sense of peace and joy in our life that we've not known uh, before. So let's look at the structure uh, based upon the scripture of what I have identified as Fort Grace, as the stronghold of grace. And again, we have commented that it is a place of safety and contentment, but serves as a base of operation. Now, a good fort has towers. Well, the towers of Fort Grace are constructed of the biblical material that orients you and me to God's provision and treatment in grace. The support for the towers, and there are three, God's righteousness at Christ's expense. For living the Christian life then, God's resources at Christ's expense. And for eternity, we have God's realm at Christ's expense. Those three towers stand above the fort to protect us from any kind of attack. Look at the one that is identified for salvation, wherein we get God's righteousness at Christ's expense. One of Satan's ploys with his minions is to detract us from our service to God by claiming that we are sinners and certainly not worthy to represent God. Well, we certainly need to understand that at salvation, we have received God's righteousness at Christ's expense. 
And our salvation is not dependent upon our behavior, but is dependent upon the behavior of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that does not give us a license to sin, but rather it redeems us from the penalty of sin. And we will hasten to quickly insert that because we have God's righteousness at Christ's expense, we are now able to be free from the constraint of the old nature, from the domination of the old nature. We now can have victory over him. So it's not an excuse for us to sin, but it is an assurance that we have an ability to cease from those sins in our growing process as we mature for the Lord. So we become children of God as a result of salvation. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God has given us his righteousness so that we might be acceptable unto him. What a marvel as you go through the scriptures and understand that basic concept. That's one of the primary towers of our refuge and our support and our base of operation in Fort Grace. But there's a second tower that we mentioned, and that is uh, in living the Christian life, we have God's uh, resources at Christ's expense. To live day by day, we are not expected to provide our own resources, our own enablement, to develop our own ability, but we are dependent upon the provision that God has made in the tower of grace as we identify it as God's resources at Christ's expense. We are able to utilize the things that God gives us. He never calls us to do a task, assigns us a responsibility, allows us to be in a circumstance that he has not provided the resources by which we can have victory there and through which we can serve him effectively. What a marvel it is to watch the grace of God operating in the life of a believer as, as we see it occurring on a day-by-day -day basis, taking us to places we never imagined we could go, giving us abilities that we had never imagined that we could have. Pastor Carlos is not here tonight, so I'll pick on him just a little bit. I uh, was about to take a vacation uh, try to get one of those uh, two-week vacations with both ends of the vacation open. You know, leave on a Sunday night after church and get back. I'd be gone one Sunday and then get back the next Saturday night so I could be in the pulpit the the following Sunday and only be out of the pulpit one Sunday. But we we actually were given a month by the church. Uh, didn't dare take it if I was afraid if I'd be gone that long, I'd come back and find out they had another pastor instead of me. But uh, we, uh, we had decided we might take a little extra time that we were going to leave on a Sunday night. We were going to be gone one Sunday. And rather than come back the following Saturday, we might just wait and come back the following week. I had a man that was going to fill the pulpit for me on the Sunday that I was gone a man for Sunday morning and a man for Sunday evening. And pondering that second week, I said to Pastor Carlos, he was not a pastor at that time, he had never preached at that time, I said, uh, Carlos, I'm thinking about taking another week and being gone. I wondered if you would be willing to fill the pulpit for me. There was dead silence and his jaw dropped considerably. And he said, who, me? And I said, yes, you. And he said, I can't do that. Why would you ask me to do that? I can't do that. I've never done that. I can't do that. And I said, well, I know you've never done that. I disagree that you can't do that. 
I believe that you have the gift to teach and to proclaim God's word in a public setting. And I would not have asked you if I didn't think that you could do it. Uh, no, 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 he said, I couldn't do that. Uh, no, I, I, I can't do that. So I said, okay, I just wanted to offer you the opportunity. I don't know if I'm going to be gone that next Sunday, but I just thought you could fill in and you could preach a sermon that Sunday. No, no, no way I can do that, he said. So the next day, I believe it was the second day after that, he said to me, Pastor, is that invitation to fill in for you, to preach for you while you're going still open? And I said, well, I still may take that other week. I don't know. I, why are you interested? And he said, yeah, I think I would like to do that. And I said, okay, now I may not be gone, but you need to be prepared in case I am gone. Uh, you need to be prepared in order to, to do that and uh, I'll what I'll do I'll call you later and I'll let you know whether I'm going to come home or whether I'm going to stay out and uh, I'll give you you know a couple of days warning on that so that you can uh, go ahead and be prepared but prepare like you were going to preach that Sunday okay well later during the second week I called him and I said how are things going and we did the the, the friendly chit chat. And I said, uh, I've decided to come on home. We're going to be home on Friday. And uh, so uh, I won't need anybody to fill the pulpit for me. There was a dead silence on the other end of the phone. He said, oh, I was really looking forward to preaching. Uh, could I still do it? And I said, yes, if you want to do it, uh, I'll slip out of town. I'll come home on Friday, and then I'll slip out of town Sunday morning and go somewhere else. And he said, no, I'd like for you to be there. Well, I didn't expect that kind of confidence, but <laughs> that's what he said. And uh, so I said, all right, it's a deal. I'll be there. I'll take care of the service. You do the preaching. When he took the pulpit, it was like he had done that a million times before. He, he was perfectly at home. He had a full grasp of what he was attempting to do. And you can see the spirit of God and the power of God operating in his life. And there was no question from then on whether God had gifted him to do the work that he's called him to do and that he's doing. It's so amazing. It was as amazing to him as it was to some of us others. I, I actually had a good deal of confidence, but I was blown away with his ease and, uh, and professionalism uh, as, he, as he preached that first time. And so that was just the beginning. Of course, he's preached many, many times since then and taught uh, the word of God. And God led him into this, uh, take over this ministry to develop this ministry, actually dumped it in his lap. And, uh, and he's doing a, a good job with it because he's using God's resources at Christ's expense. God has a purpose and plan for each one of us. And it, will, it, it is as natural to us as anything else that we might do in the human realm because we have God's resources with which to do it. And if, if my story about his beginning differs from his, we'll work out the details <laughs> later. Okay. But uh, it was... Uh, it was a, a great blessing to see him preach that first time and to no one would have ever guessed that it was his first time to be in that position. I've seen some others on the other hand 
that have struggled with it and some that found out by that action that was not what they were gifted to do and uh, and we're having to operate in the energy of the flesh. But we have Fort Grace and it's one of its towers is the Tower of Grace, God's resources at Christ's expense to live the Christian life and to do the things of God. The, the third tower that this fort is built around that serves as a support for the fort, and that is what we identify as grace, God's realm at Christ's expense. God's kingdom is ours. We are children of God. We are joint heirs together with Christ. We are a kingdom of kings and priests. We are going to rule and reign with Christ, not only in the millennium, but through all of eternity. That's one of the main pillars, towers of this fort that we are identifying from the scripture as the place of refuge to which we can go. There should be no question where we are going to spend eternity. Now there may be some question about what we're going to be doing in it because there is so little in the Bible about eternity. Uh, there's very little about heaven. There's a whole lot more about hell, but very little about heaven, but enough to get me excited about it and to listen to the Apostle Paul who had been there and uh, come back and wasn't able to give us uh, uh, the description he had liked to give us because God forbade him to do that. And uh, uh, we need to understand we are joint heirs together with Christ. And this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, the song goes. And we are here as representatives of the king and uh, assigned to do his work. He provides salvation, his righteousness. He provides resources to live the life. And he provides his kingdom as an eternal end for us. Those three towers are the support for God's fortress stronghold of grace. But a fort needs some walls. The walls of Fort Grace are constructed of the biblical material that orients you to the implementation of treating others in grace. Well, I kind of wish we hadn't have said that. Huh. <laughs> We have God's grace that provide the towers, but the walls around the fort that are going to, going to provide peace and refuge and protection for you is going to be constructed of the biblical material that identifies the responsibility that we have of treating others in grace. It's so marvelous to read of God's grace and to study God's grace and understand his righteousness, his resources, his realm at Christ's expense. But the real structure that we need in order to live life fully and protectively and to have a proper base of operation requires that we build the walls out of Bible information that assigns to us the responsibility to treat others in grace. As you learn to treat others in grace, you become free from enemy attack. You see, if you don't have expectations and demands of others, they're not going to disappoint you. You're not going to get angry and frustrated when others don't carry their end of the load because as you have treated them in grace, you haven't required of them that they carry their end of the load or that they meet the responsibilities that you're meeting. Our treatment of others in grace is the secret to joy, to peace, and to protection 
from attack as we live life here upon the earth. We will never be able to have a relaxed mental attitude, a sense of peace that passes all understanding beyond our willingness to treat others in grace. It rolls off the tongue so easy, treat others in grace. Well, wow, it's a totally different concept to our human nature to not require of anyone any exertion on their part, but a willingness for us to pick up the tab, to care, to pay the expense, to assume all the responsibility for relationship with them. Do I dare ask if we've done that? Do I dare ask if we're willing to do that? And yet our joy and our peace is dependent upon it. Our protection from attack is dependent upon our erecting walls that are made of Bible information that explains our responsibility to treat others in grace. I have an entire series on this particular subject and we probably will uh, address it. I'm not sure just exactly the direction Pastor Carlos has for us to go uh, as we uh, wrap up this concept of dealing with the old nature, but it's really a part of the package that we learn to treat others in grace. I had uh, preached on that one Sunday evening when I pastored a church over in Monrovia, California. And that evening after the service, there were uh, oh, about four of the families that we went out to dinner after the service, went out to Bob's Big Boy uh, that evening uh, to have a bite to eat before we headed home. And uh, uh, there, as the food was being brought to the table, I turned to our minister of music uh, and I said, Bill, would you offer grace? And he said, not on your life. And I looked at him and I said, what did you say? He said, not on your life. I said, you won't thank God for our food? He said, that's not what you said. He said, you asked me if I would offer grace. You just got through preaching for an hour that grace was picking up the tab, was paying the expense for everyone else. No, I'm not willing to do that, he said. I am willing to offer thanks for our food, but they're going to have to buy their own food. <laughs> well, that is the concept of gracing others, a willingness to pick up the tab, to pay the expense, to carry all of the, assume all of the responsibility for having a relationship with others. It'll grow on you, and we will be able to support that by the Word of God. Uh, it's a new concept from humanity and human reasoning. It means that we have no expectations of others, and they cannot disappoint us if we have no expectation. It means we assume all of the responsibility for our relationship so they can't fail us. It means that we treat them in grace regardless of their response, and so they can't frustrate us. Sounds marvelous. It takes some doing, but God has provided in his word and through his spirit our ability to do it. There's more to a fort than the towers of grace God's righteousness, God's resources, and God's realm. Without the walls, the towers may be able to defend us somewhat, but they will leave us vulnerable to attack from others, and we will be our own worst enemy. Our expectations or our demands of others will destroy the opportunity of having peace and contentment in our lives. Well, the walls towers, but there are also some quarters in the fort. Your personal quarters in Fort Grace is constructed of biblical material 
that orients you to the implementation of treating yourself in grace. Did you hear that? Of treating yourself in grace. We have to learn to treat others in grace, but we have to learn as well to treat ourselves in grace. If we're going to be comfortable in Fort Grace, we'll need to learn how to treat ourselves in grace. And when you treat ourselves in grace, then we will deal with the sin issue the way God deals with it. As a result, we'll become free from guilt and free from low self-esteem. We'll no longer excuse ourselves from serving God on the basis that we're not worthy. We will not be rendered impotent by our guilt. We will learn to deal with sin and accept it as God does, approach it as God does, view it as God does, and we will de develop a completely different concept of ourselves in our relationship with it. So the, the towers are built out of God's treatment of us in grace, his righteousness, his resources, and his realm. The walls of the fort are built out of the biblical material that identifies our responsibility to treat others in grace. And the quarters where we live, where we sleep, is going to be built out of the biblical information that identifies our treating ourselves in grace and using God's remedy for sin, not just 1 John 1, 9, but James chapter 1, where we avoid temptation, where we flee from the, uh, the temptation, we utilize the tools that God has provided for us. So Fort Grace is a biblical basis from which we are able to operate in the, the slaying of dragons that we face in our life and of giants that might threaten our peace and our joy. There's a battle cry that can be heard in Fort Grace. The battle cry is one that was uttered by David long ago. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Now we will not develop any kind of relaxed mental attitude or peace in our life beyond our accepting that battle cry, that the battle is the Lord's. You'll suffer from fear. You will experience anxiety. You will become angry. You'll wallow in your frustrations. You'll experience disappointment and all those other things that deprive us of peace and joy and comfort of a relaxed mental attitude. Now, if you don't both understand and accept the battle is the Lord's, then you will not be able to have victory over the old nature and live the life that God has commissioned you to live and provided the resources for you to live. The battle is the Lord's is the battle cry. The understanding and the acceptance of, of David of that battle cry when he went out to fight Goliath is a good example for us. David had actually earned his RMA. He had a relaxed mental attitude uh, that took him to the battle scene with confidence and peace. Operating from Fort Grace, David ran out to meet the giant. You are able to do the same thing we can't just stay locked up in the fort and, and hide out. It must be a base of operation. And David used it for that as well. We need to run out and meet the giants, but we need to have the right understanding and the right orientation so that we can win. We'll not win the battle locked up in the fort. Jesus indicated that we were to be in the world though not of the world. So the fort is a place where we become equipped, uh, where we plan battle strategy, 
uh, where we become refreshed. It's a place of defense. But the battle is not fought in the fort. That's only a base of operation. The battle is fought in the world. So settle back and hang on to me. We're going to do a little Blitzkrieg through the story of David's confidence and peace in the midst of fighting giants. Let's see if I can do this in the next 25 minutes that we have. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered themselves to, or gathered together their armies to battle, and they were gathered together at Shukal, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shukal and Azka uh, to uh, Esphidamian. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So once again, Israel was in a threatening position with a need for God to deliver his people. The Valley of Elah was a wide valley about 15 miles southwest of Jerusalem. The word champion identifies a master warrior, and Goliath certainly was that. His height is said to have been six cubits and a span, which makes him about nine feet, nine inches tall. He was a descendant of a race of giants, the Anakim, who had all been but wiped out by Joshua during the conquest when they went in to take the land of Canaan. Joshua chapter 11, verse 22 states that only Anakim, uh, the only Anakim left were in Gaza, in Ashdod, and in Gath. Goliath hails from Gath, according to the text. And uh, he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. And he said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that he may fight, we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. His armor was all of bronze, his coat of mail, 5,000 shekels of brass. That's 156 and a quarter pounds. It was a long vest that was made of overlapping bronze plates. It said he had greaves of brass upon his legs. In other words, uh, his, uh, uh, he had shin plates that were made out of brass to cover his shins. The spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. That would be about 18 and three quarter pounds. He said, choose for you a man. Now, it was possible in ancient times to decide the outcome of a battle between two people by a contest of that kind between two individuals. But Israel was greatly dismayed and afraid. They had no one to match Goliath 
physically or to be well armed as was this giant. And apparently they had no one with an RMA degree that was willing to destroy this giant. And uh, so they were fearful. Now, David, the son of the Ephorite of Bethlehem, Judah, of Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he was, had eight sons. And the man went among men, an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. The names of the three sons that went to the battle were Elab, the firstborn, and next unto him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. You'd have to go back to chapter 16 of 1 Samuel to understand what it meant David returned from Saul. Uh, David uh, had been playing the harp to soothe uh, the anxiety that was brought on by an evil spirit that would come upon King Saul. God had, remember, removed his spirit from Saul, and now as a result, he was being victimized by an evil spirit. So David played the harp, and Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit would de depart from him. So David now had gone back to his father's house and taken over his duties uh, uh, of feeding the sheep. Uh, music certainly might soothe, but God's word is what it takes to stabilize. Music's one of those quick fixes for many believers, but when the dragons and the giants threaten, it's only the word of God that is going to produce the relaxed mental attitude that we need. Verse 16 says, And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Drip, drip, drip. 40 days of dripping and torture for the Israelites. 40 days of fear. 40 days of anxiety. 40 days of worry. Drip, drip, drip. Well, count them 40 drips. Uh, and, and they wondered, would it ever stop? Someone asked me, does the dripping ever stop in our circumstances? And the answer to that is no. The dripping never stops. Not in this lifetime. It will in the lifetime to come, but not in this lifetime. But we can develop an immunity to the dripping if we take the word of God and make it our refuge. So for 40 days, the giant challenged them. Look at verse 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of the thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him and came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistine had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and he ran into the army, and he came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked to them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and he spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid, more dripped drip, drip of circumstance. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that he has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up, and it shall be that the man that killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. 
And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For he, who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. So David is introduced in the text as the son of Jesse. Now the events that are here are not intended to follow chronologically, but rather to show how, how God had actually prepared David for the occasion of being the deliverer of Israel at this point. David went and returned from Saul. See, David had been with Saul to play the heart, but he had since returned then back to Bethlehem, according to the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. Now, he had the responsibility now of taking food to his brothers that were in Saul's army, and so he heard the challenge of the Philistine Goliath that he should defy the armies of the living God. David had great faith in God, and he believed that as long as the people trusted God, there was no enemy that they could not conquer. He seemed to be alone in his thinking on that. We We read in verse 28 then, And Elab his eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men, and Elab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Notice the the judgment on the part of the older brother. Uh, He identifies the naughtiness of the heart of David, uh, saying, I know your pride. Sometimes uh, uh, folks take confidence Uh, they mistake that as pride or conceit. Uh, They take ability and misunderstand it as arrogance. Certainly, uh, David had uh, uh, proved himself on a number of occasions in these areas, but uh, he's uh, accusing David, Elam's accusing David of going through all this just so he can see the battle. Uh, David, however, has a different agenda when he hears this challenge. And David said, what have I done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake in the same manner. And the people answered him again after the same manner. And When the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. So we see in the text that Elam's anger was kindled. He, David was being put down by his brother. Uh, His brother might well have responded to that call, but did not. And and now he's belittling David's age and the fact that he's a shepherd of a few sheep. uh, And uh, is really questioning. But David says, is there not a cause? Now, a better translation of that, it's an idiom. A better translation would be, There's nothing wrong with asking, is there? Well, at any rate, Elam does not seem to be able to stop David from asking. David continues to inquire into the matter, and his inquisitiveness then is brought to the attention of Saul the king, and Saul calls for him uh, to see what he has to say. David uh, says, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go fight with this Philistine. So David offers to defeat the giant, uh, having God on his side. Uh, The king is looking at the physical aspect of it and says, thou art but a youth. Well, the New International Version says, you're only a boy. 
Uh, that's the, the term is said in sarcasm. But David and Saul are not on the same wavelength, you see. David's not thinking of going in his own strength as a boy. No, he's thinking of going as the emissary of God and that the battle is not his, the battle is the Lord's. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So David presents his resume. He had been in harm's way before. He had recognized the need to, to have uh, uh, the support of God. Uh, and he identifies then that there came a lion and a bear into the sheepfold. Now, those were our ferocious uh, uh, animals uh, uh, that are feared by grown and experienced men. But David had faced them uh, and... Uh, had taken the life of both the bear and the lion to deliver his sheep. So David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. The word delivered is translated from the Hebrew word nostal, and it means rescue or save. It's the same word that's used when God delivered his people from danger. Since David had rescued ship, you know, sheep uh, from his father's flock with the help of God, he saw no difficulty then in rescuing Israel were they not the sheep of God's flock uh, through having the same trust that he had in God? And since Goliath had defied the armies of the living God, according to David, he didn't have a chance to win. God, David said, he will deliver me. David trusted in the Lord alone then to rescue him and uses that same Hebrew word for deliver. The, the last few words of that verse 37, Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with you. Not the first time that there had been any kind of reference on the part of the king or perhaps any thought on the part of Israel to the Lord at this particular point. We find then that the king is so desperate that he is willing to send this boy <laughs> because the boy's willing to go. I don't really think that the king has yet been uh, convinced that the battle is the Lord's. David hadn't uttered that word yet. He was going to. I don't think that the king fully understood uh, the concept of this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine, as challenging the God of Israel. Uh, but David certainly has that concept. Now, Saul reverts to human logic and reasoning at that point, not only saying, well, go and the Lord go with you. But we see in verse 38, Saul armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. Interesting. Interesting. The scripture tells us concerning the physical description of King Saul that he stood head and shoulders above any man in Israel. And he takes his armor <laughs> and offers it to David. He puts his armor on this lad, the one that he has described as a boy, as a youth, and he puts his armor on him. 
we see in verse 39, David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Well, human logic and human viewpoint would suggest that we revert to that kind of protection that shepherd boy needs some armor. He needs a coat of mail. He needs some kind of defense. He needs a helmet of bronze uh, upon his head if he's going to go out and fight this Goliath. But we have to remember in David's mind, David is not the one going out to fight this Goliath. No, he's not the giant slayer. He has in his mind that God is, that this is the Lord's battle. So human viewpoint would say we can't go to battle without this proper armament uh, with the logic and the reasoning of man. The drip, drip, drip of circumstances will not be diminished, however, by our attempting to address those issues from human perspective. Saul armed David with his own armor. And since he was head and shoulders above all in Israel, his armor must have been way too large for David to handle at that particular point. David does not say that he cannot wear the armor because it's too big, but rather he says he cannot wear it because it is something he's unaccustomed to. And he took his staff in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and he put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script. And his, he had his sling in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So he puts off the armor, takes his shepherd sling, stops at the brook, and picks up five smooth stones. Wonder why five smooth stones? we we'll find he only used one. That was all he needed. I don't know if he needed the reserve. Some have suggested, and they pointed out the fact that Goliath had four brothers. That would be five giants. We're not given any information that they were there with the army of the Philistines. Uh, but we do know that he did have four brothers. I don't know if that's information that David even knew. So I don't know why the five stones. Oh, let's see. Five is the biblical number of grace. I wonder if that, well, that's a lot of speculation. Every time I speculate, I get in trouble. So uh, I'm not sure as to why he took the five stones. Uh, we will see when the battle ensues that he doesn't need but the one. Uh, and he does need a sword if he's going to to sever the head of the giant and give it to the king. But then Goliath is packing a sword, so he just takes the shepherd's sling, that which he is familiar with, but most of all, he takes the knowledge that the battle is the Lord's. That will suffice us when we go out to slay the dragons and the giants that we have to encounter. We must remember the battle is the Lord's. Now, if we depend upon human reasoning and logic, it will encumber us and will defeat us. David had the gumption to lay it aside, to take it off. It's something that he hadn't tested. Take it off and go with what he had tried before. And it had proven himself, it had proven itself uh, acceptable before. So he goes out to meet the giant, and he will utter the battle cry: "The battle is the Lord's." Well, we'll pick up here next time and look at how the battle rages. I know it's a story we've all heard, 
But let's look at it in the concept of what we're dealing with here in our study. We are born with an old sin nature. That is, we have a natural tendency to sin. That old nature has authority over us before our salvation. He is our old man, our husband, and we're under his authority. But as a result of personal faith in Jesus Christ, we appropriate the grace of God. God's righteousness is credited to our account, and we stand holy and without blame before God in love. God's resources are given us, and we are enabled to live the Christian life, to walk the walk, to talk the talk, to live the life that he has designed for us, and to experience the peace that passes all understanding. You see, it's only in Fort Grace that we're going to find the peace that passes all understanding. And for grace has these support towers that we have identified, God's righteousness, God's resources, and God's realm at Christ's expense. David understands that as he goes out to meet the giant. David had the word of God that had been revealed up to that point, and he was a student of the word, and he was willing to place his faith and dependency upon it. He essays to slay dragons, well, at least to fight Goliath, and uh, to do so with the awareness that this is the Lord's battle. We need to have that same attitude as we go through life day by day. We need to understand the towers of grace and the, the support that they give to us in a time of need. But we need to understand as well the walls, and we need to erect those walls with an attitude of treating others in grace. Now, I know if we treat other people in grace, they are going to abuse it. Uh, yes, I know that because we abuse God's grace, do we not? And I know that because I treat others in grace and have that abuse come right back to me. Been counseling with one young man for some time. Well, what? Four or five years. And the problem that he faces, he understands. He says, I, I wish I could have the attitude that you do when you do all that you can do for them and they abuse you and, uh, and are not appreciative. When you, they, you teach them and then they don't apply it. He said, I don't quite understand how you can do that. And I pointed out it's by gracing others. He said he wanted that provision, but he's unwilling to apply the grace. I can't do it, he said. I can't treat people in grace that abuse me, that take advantage of me. Well, four or five years we've been talking, and he continues to waller in his misery, in his frustration, in his disrupted relationships with others, because he will not apply the principles of grace. So let me challenge you. We're going to pick up here next week and, and look at the battle, but we need to recognize what had gone on in the life of David to get him to this point. How could he identify the battle is truly the Lord's? It was because of the indoctrination that he had in his relationship with God. So we're going to look at that next week. Now we're going to need to uh, take some time now and deal with questions. I'm going to have to take a minute, Ken, and uh, this Bluetooth that I have 
uh, where the speaker is coming through. I made a mistake tonight in not going into the bedroom and turning the Bluetooth off. So I'm listening to myself and I'll be listening to your questions, but I'm also listening to the television and the newscast that's in there in the bedroom. It's a little bit more than I wanna handle. So if you give me just a minute, I will go in and shut that switch off and I'll be right back, okay? <laughs> That's a whole lot better. All right. Sorry about that. All this modern technology, I'm not up to par yet. Okay. I'm, I'm ready to um, hear your questions. Notice I said hear your questions. I didn't say answer your questions. <laughs> Who be first? Who be yeah, I Good evening, doctor. Uh, I have two questions. Yes, sir. Um, one's a little confusing to me, but um, hoping you can help me out with it. Uh, one of them is um, in Luke 22, 36 through 38. It says, because um, I heard I, um, um, the impression with uh, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Uh -huh. I don't know if you heard of it. Okay, so here it says in Luke twenty-two thirty-six. but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Did Jesus advocate the use of a sword for self-defense purposes or something else? He did. In the passage prior to that, just leading up to that, he identified when I sent when I was here and I sent you out before, I told you not to take a purse, not to take a script, any script, but I'm leaving and I'm going to be gone. And so I say if you don't have a sword, mm -hmm. say your cloak and buy one. Now, we not only have to know what went on in front of the story, but we have to listen to what went on after that passage. Mm. Because they went from there out to the garden. Mm -hmm. And there the army came, the, the Roman uh, soldiers came with the high priest to arrest Jesus. Right. And uh, uh, Jesus, uh, when, when Peter saw that, he drew his sword immediately and took the ear off of one of the servants of the high priest. I don't think he was going for the ear. I don't, must have been a maneuver something like this. That he was going for the juggler. But uh, God told him to put away his sword. He just told them, if you don't have one, sell your coat and buy one. And then when Peter uses his, he, he actually chastises Peter a little bit about it. And that's where we have the statement, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. He identifies in, in the passage, if we harmonize it together and look at it in its total context, he certainly identifies the concept of, of self-defense, but he identifies that that's not to be our lifestyle, but that's not the, we're not to live by that kind of lifestyle. That was just uh, that for that reason, moment. The so sword, just... yeah. And certainly okay. he had already identified to Peter what was going to happen that evening, but Peter thought he would change the situation. Would that so, have changed, would that have changed the whole prophecy? 
Oh, certainly, yeah. So uh, uh, it had to play out the way it played out. Mm -hmm. So there is a place that that is taught for our self-defense, but we need to always remember the battle is the Lord's mm -hmm. and not run ahead of the Lord in it. Uh, and not let not live by the sword, live by the reality of God's support, but he has provided for it, even instructed, it's in the imperative mood, commanded to to get the sword now that he's going to be leaving. So a sword in that day would be a different weapon in our day. Right. Uh, uh, and and I believe doesn't justify but rather instructs us that we do have a responsibility. And I personally carry a concealed weapon for some time in California that's that's a difficult task anymore. Right. Uh, in in Idaho the Second Amendment is our concealed weapon. Anybody can carry openly or conceal uh, in this thing. But uh, I have been working today on um, a meeting that is coming up uh, a week from this Saturday. Uh, there's a need for us to train our people uh, so that we can have an active shooter situation. Uh, we've seen churches attack, and I believe it's going to escalate. Now, I've always kind of been torn uh, with it because God's able, whether I've got a gun or not, God's able to take care. But at the same time, he gives the instruction for that. And right. so I think we, we have to have a sensible balance in there. And uh, uh, in the congregation where I serve, probably, um, well, there's probably at least 10 men out of the congregation of about 70 total people uh, that are packing uh, a weapon. Uh, some of them visible uh, and open carry, mm -hmm. uh, others are concealed. Uh, but we need some kind of policy about when it's appropriate to draw that weapon, right. when it's appropriate to use that weapon. We don't need eight or nine cowboys shooting and doing their own thing. <laughs> We've got somebody, some Goliath coming in threatening us. Um, so we have, a, we have a responsibility. I've used my, uh, used a weapon a number of times uh, to defend other people. Uh, and uh, I've never had to pull the trigger. I am capable of pulling the trigger and a man should not ever carry a gun if he doesn't have the ability to pull the trigger. But we have to have that total concept. But it's not something we should live by because we perish by it if we do. But it's part of the package right. that God has given us. Now I have a, I have a scar. 44, 44 Magnum? Well, yeah, but I have a scar right there on, on my chest Yeah. from a bullet oh, wow. yeah. that I took uh, doing undercover work in uh, downtown San Francisco. Mm -hmm. When I was pastor in Pittsburgh, California, I did undercover work with the police department. And some way or other, my cover on a buy apparently had gotten blown. And a very unprofessional individual tried to shoot me or did shoot me with a 25 automatic okay. across the street from a second story window of an abandoned hotel. That's way too far for a 25 automatic. <laughs> and the, the bullet stuck to my shirt. I, I felt the, the, the thud, we heard the, yeah. the shot and I was talking to the chief police and I, I had a suit, I unbuttoned the jacket and the slug fell down on the pavement and I carry it. Our God's able uh, to, to do whatever he needs, but he has given us some instruction. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be sensible in utilizing that and carrying that through. Wow. Is that helpful? Yes, it, it is because um, there's a lot of fear with, with that 
same kind of concept with me, you know. Um, that's something I just take up with the Lord, but uh, there's a fear there. And um, I don't know if you read between the lines, but um, I just need to work on that with myself. But I just, I read it in scripture and I was just kind of like hoping um, that it was for protection or it could be used for protection in another sense versus you know the, what happened in the past or what went on in the past is well, well he makes that very clear in the past i was here i sent you out but now i'm going to be gone mm-hmm. and you need to do this you need to carry a purse you need to right carry a sword right and, uh, so i think there's certainly a balance there and those that aren't able to handle that they need to stay away from it and let those of us that can take care of it i agree Okay, my, my other question is, it's, I'm struggling with this one, but um, it won't be as, as um, okay, it says uh, in the Lord's Prayer, um, when it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, does Jesus imply that God can lead us into temptation? Well, it's actually kind of a double negative in that, um, that that God says he does not tempt any man with evil. Remember, when we began this series, mm-hmm. we identified in temptation that no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man with evil. So he certainly doesn't lead us into it. It's a double negative in the language, which is to protect us from being led in to evil. But this is the Lord's Prayer. Mm-hmm. It's called the Lord's Prayer. It's identified as model prayer. Uh, I have alienated some in the past by making this statement, but I'll go ahead and make it again. The Lord's Prayer is not applicable to the church age believer. The Lord's Prayer is a model prayer under the law. We are no longer under the law. I know it was the apostles who said, teach us how we ought to pray. And he said, pray in this manner. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. Exactly, is is the, the language, in exactly the same way we forgive others their trespasses. That's not God's program of grace. That's the inadequacy of the law. Uh That's not a prayer that I want to pray. It's not a prayer that I pray. I certainly don't want God's forgiveness on the basis of my forgiving others. I want it on God's grace. So uh, I I made that statement in a class one time at at, at, uh, Channel Islands Bible College, and a man really was offended by it got up and went and withdrew from the school, withdrew from all of his classes from the school, and sent others to deal with me. Oh, wow. But uh, uh, I had three different students tell me that they were coming because of something that I had said about the Lord's Prayer, and, and they wanted to challenge me on it. But uh, in the process, all three ended up graduating four years later from the school. Uh, but that, that man never came back. He was true to his word. Uh, We have to understand the dispensational structure that God has placed. And uh, so the Lord's Prayer, uh, I'm not willing to to let that be the standard by which I get God's forgiveness. It's certainly in conflict with the whole of Scripture Mm. and uh, identifies our inability. The same way where if you came under the law, if you came to present your gift, and you had ought against your brother, you were to go leave the gift, go take care of it with the brother and come back. And yet we find in the New Testament concept, that's that's under the law, that's, that's an inability that we have uh, because of the law, that if we get right with God, then we get right with our fellow man. Right. It's not getting right with the fellow man in order to get right with God. We have to get right with God in order to have the heart to get right with the fellow man. So I think we have to see how they fit into God's outline of of and framework of time. 
Did that confuse you more? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, you did it. Well. I appreciate it. I appreciate it because I just wasn't sure. <clears throat> I was kind of, you know, I was struggling with it, but I have a different outlook on it now. By okay, well, we can, we can rest assured by the James passage that he does not lead us into temptation. Right. Uh, recently, recently, the Pope has been trying to change that, take that out of Scripture. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, for, the, for the Roman Catholic Church, because they, of course, believe that's part of our, our deal today. And because he doesn't believe that God uh, leads us into temptation, he has eliminated it from their Scripture. Yeah. Right. I can see why. Okay. Just Thank a matter you. of understanding. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Someone else? So well. <coughs> Next. Good evening. Good evening. All right. So I don't know. I don't remember if you brought it up or not about the five stones, but is there, what was the significance of them being smooth? <laughs> well, a anyone that uses a sling yes. recognizes that a smooth stone is very preferable over a rough stone as far as it leaving the, the pocket of the sling and it's, it's traveled through the air. Oh, okay. So that would, anyone that used the sling in that today understand the significance of the smoothness. We might debate the significance of the five stones, <laughs> but the smoothness was trajectory and and uh, the compatibility with leaving the sling. Okay. All right. That was, that's it. Good. Thank you. You guys are really picking it apart. That's good. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Nothing's incidental in the word. That's true. That's right. Good evening, Mr. Kyle. Hey, Pastor. <clears throat> okay, so, um, it's fine. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> shut up, Joe. <laughs> they're, they're making fun of my hair. Um, okay, so. They're not so, treating you in grace? <laughs> are they not treating you in grace? No, they're not treating me with grace, no. <laughs> um, okay, so, David is a giant, right? Goliath. Or Goliath, sorry. Goliath is a giant, and um, before the flood, there was giants, right? Um, that's part of the, what the Nephilim, right? Uh, the the one of the reasons why God destroyed uh, the uh, the um, the earth because of the Nephilim. Is that is that that's correct, right? It's part of it. Yeah, but we we need to understand that they were not just they were not the sons of Anak, or uh, they were not giants, as Goliath was a giant. They were a composite of half human and half angelic being. Okay. The word "sons of God" in the Hebrew is "benaha Elohim." That's never used of human beings. When, it, when it's human beings, it's B'nai Elohim. When it's angelic beings, they are B'naha Elohim. Okay. And that's the, the sons of God uh, looked upon the daughters of God and saw that they were beautiful and took them wives, all of whom they chose. Uh, the, the taking of those women is forcible. It's rape, not marriage. And the offspring were, were half angel and half man, half human. They are the basis for Greek and Hebrew mythology. But, of course, they're the basis for it. Um, that's a whole different can of worms <laughs> when we look at that passage because there are those who believe that sons of God were the godly descendants of Seth and daughters of, of uh, man, man were the ungodly descendants of Cain. Uh, there weren't any godly ones. 
at that particular point, they, there was only one righteous family in all the earth. And that was Noah and his family. Yeah. And in the language, so uh, we could explore that on another. So time. he was he was but just a... not to confuse those men, super beings, as being the giants in the day of Goliath. He was just a tall human. Yeah, okay. and they and they were identified as giants. Okay. And uh, Is, are those the same? Those are the same giants that uh, Joseph. Um, or the the Israelites went into the the land, and uh, uh, the spies came back, and they said that they're giants. Right, okay. right. All right. We are the same ones. Uh, so from the same family, Can Canaanites, right? Well, yeah, they were they were actually Anakims that that were there. They were a particular from a particular family or tribe. Uh, of those that dwelled in in Canaan, uh, but they were they were a uh, a very large human um, tribe, a family, of genetic um, group of, of people. And we we found some remnants of them uh, in archaeological digs. Yeah, I've, I've seen the big old skeletons that they've found. Yeah. It's they probably got so big from the big old grapes that they were eating. <laughs> yeah, it could well be. <laughs> All right, Pastor. All right, Pastor. All right. Oh, well, thank you. Good evening. My name is Mike, and I'm new. I've been here for about a week and a half. Okay, Mike, welcome. Thank you. Um, kind of build on on. Kyle's question there, um, those, I mean, I believe in the men of renown, and, and I believe with you that um, that uh, they were a, a mating of human women and angels, uh -huh. and that the men of renown, renown were kind of where we get our, our ancient Greek myths and everything from. Uh -huh. um, but could you explain how an angel with, because angels don't have earthly bodies aren't they spiritual how they would mate with humans and i mean how does that happen <clears throat> if i could explain that i'd be a wealthy man okay, okay. <laughs> i uh there there are some things that we find in the word of god that we don't have detail that lays that out we do know that angels are able to take upon themselves form uh, the fallen angels, demonic spirits, are able to take upon themselves form. I believe, uh, and based on the grammatical structure of the scripture, that all angels are male. Now, I had a professor in college uh, that said these cannot be angels because angels are sexless. So I asked him to document that. And he said, well, Jesus said in Matthew, when, they, when the uh, Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection, uh, challenged Jesus about the resurrection, they said, suppose a man marries a woman, uh, or a woman marries a man, and he dies, and uh, she marries his brother, as the law prescribes, and she goes through seven of them. In eternity, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And Jesus said, she'll not be anybody's wife, that we're going to be as the angels there is, where there is no marriage or giving in marriage. Well, every time we have the word angel, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, it's masculine. It's not neuter. And so that would indicate there is some masculinity to it. If they're all males, then they're not going to be any marriage unless it's San Francisco or, or some other places that have have infiltrated that idea of men marrying men. Uh, but certainly that's not the biblical concept. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we need to understand uh, that how that came about, I don't know. I do know that the language is, is graphic enough in the grammar and the construction to indicate that they fathered these men of renown. And uh, how that came about, I don't know. 
I also know that those that participated in that are bound in the bottomless pit right now. That they've been reserved according to Jude and Revelation and Peter. They have been reserved in darkness until the middle of the tribulation. And then they're going to be released to wreak havoc on the earth again. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why I couldn't answer why they couldn't do that today. Why some of the fallen angels couldn't do that today. Uh, I, the Bible doesn't tell us. Yeah. So it just makes it very clear to me. I can say very dogmatically that it occurred, how it occurred. I couldn't explain. Yeah. I find it very interesting also that um, when they speak of Noah, they call, they say that he was what, pure in his genealogy which I think means his genetics, doesn't it? I mean, Absolutely. there was some weird Absolutely. stuff going on there. So, yeah. But Noah was he, a pure human. And, and that's very significant to identify that position, yeah. that he, his line had not been infiltrated. Yeah. And if we back up and go, go a bit further with that, God said, man is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And some people think that meant in 120 years, he had wiped them out with the flood. But if you do the mathematics, Noah was 500 at that point. At the point of the flood, he was 600, mm -hmm. not 620. And so what God is actually saying that if man were allowed, if, the, if he allowed that infiltration to continue, in 120 years, all of humanity would no longer be flesh. Mm. But he stopped it 20 years short with the flood and with Noah and his three sons and their wives. Interesting. So all that fits together mm. in harmony. All right. Thank you. Good to meet you, Mike. Question. Good to meet you. Good question. Hello. First of all, um, how do you like to be addressed? Doctor or pastor? Troy. Troy? <laughs> all right, Troy. Um, piggybacking on Kyle and um, Michael Jordan there, talking about Nephilim and cross genetics. Uh -huh. I wonder if you're familiar with the book of Enoch. A little bit, yeah. I have um, a copy of the book of Enoch. So what are your thoughts on that? Is it should it be in the Bible or should it not? Or should I even consider it any type of information? I think that along with, with most of the serious fundamental theologians, that it lacks what would be required to be determined as divinely inspired word of God. I certainly believe that it, includes a lot of interesting history uh, like the book of Maccabees and, and the other apocryphal books uh, that have been uh, addressed that, that some of them may have substance. I would be careful to base any doctrine on them, uh, but I find it interesting reading and it seems to harmonize. It certainly identifies the Jewish concept that there was an angelic infiltration uh, long before others of us came along with that kind of interpretation. So when you say be careful, what do you mean by... Um... I wouldn't use it as a basis for doctrine by itself. That, that I think it has some interesting reading and might be supportive of some positions, but to use it as a proof text for something or as as a divinely inspired record mm -hmm. of something that occurred, uh, especially if it doesn't harmonize with other scripture, then I would be very careful of utilizing it. So it would just be something you'd read in your spare time, you know, for like entertainment reasons, I guess? Yeah, I've, I, I've read it for interest and, and it, I think it's very interesting to find how it the conclusions of it are very similar to what I conclude in studying the scripture about that period of time. Uh, but uh, 
I, I wouldn't use it as my sole source of, of documenting something. I'd rather use what has been accepted to be the divinely inspired. But then that's judgment too, you see. So it was not included in the canon of scripture simply because they felt it lacked the, the failed to meet the standard of divine inspiration. So would that make it secular? Or Pardon? would that make it a secular book or what? Yes. Yeah. I, well, I would, it probably would be put in a religious section, uh, but historical rather than religious is how I would conclude. Wasn't Enoch, you know, chosen as a favorite of God? Well, we don't know for sure if, yeah, if the was, Enoch that was translated is that Enoch. Um, um, we, we just don't know. The Bible, the Bible doesn't tell us that Enoch wrote anything. The Bible simply tells us he was not. He walked with God and he was just taken. Uh, but whether that's the same name, the same person, or not, or whether that's someone later using that name, okay, uh, we don't know. So we don't know. For like the book of Book of James, there are seven different Jameses in the New Testament. Which one wrote the Book of James? <laughs> well, we can narrow that down by some of the things that's in the book and by other books referring to. But um, uh, Enoch may have been a popular name. Okay. Uh, others too. All right. Thank you. Good question. You're yeah, welcome. Good night. Huh? For what it's worth. <laughs> All right. Well, gentlemen, it's been good to be with you this evening, and I will look forward to tomorrow evening. We'll leave David down at the brook gathering five smooth stones, and um, tomorrow night we'll get him up the hill a little ways. And see how the battle goes. Of course, you all know the story. You know how, all know how it goes. But let's see how it applies to us. So when you retreat to your quarters tonight, you might review in your mind the fort that we've talked about and the, the material uh, that it takes to build that fort is the word of God. And we're going to be identifying the different aspects of that in the days that are ahead. So once again, you have a good evening. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, once again, we say thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that is to be our teacher to instruct us in the application of it to our lives. Father, as we handle it, we recognize the need for wisdom, that we might be able to understand its application, that we may not teach anything that is not found and documented solidly in it. And we would ask that you might challenge each man to check everything that we've discussed this evening by the word of God and accept only that that can be proven by your word, that it might be a lamp to our feet and light to our path. Bless each man, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I will.